I want to talk to you about the journey uh, this morning as we look at Palm Sunday today and heading up to uh, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, then Easter. And so we look at the journey and we're going to go on several parts of this journey. And we think about the journey and what Christ did for us. The palm, okay, the palm that held the universe took the nail of a soldier. Now, in all of this, God was never more sovereign than in the details of his death. We go from triumphal entry to broken heart to betrayal to denial and to the death on the cross. And we're going to look at why is all of that. And of course, today, you know, traditionally, it's all about triumphal entry. And, uh, and yet it's strange because we don't often get an opportunity to talk about the death on the cross. And so we're going to talk about that as well. But in, in, in Mark 11 and Luke 12, and it's a scripture Jack read, it talks about, you know, they're, they're, Jesus coming into Jerusalem for the last time. And everybody's spreading their cloaks and their palms and, and all that in honor. And they're blessed as the king, you know, peace in heaven, glory to God in the highest. They're all celebrating that. And here comes Jesus riding on a donkey and all the shouts of Hosanna and the expressions of thankfulness and praise, you know, jubilant, exultation, joyful expressions, triumphant entry, victorious, conquering, unbeatable king riding in uh, and going to bring salvation, deliverance. And why not? You know, they should have celebrated and, and we should celebrate and we are celebrating. Uh, we're celebrating today uh, as we gather together. All of us are giving our praises to God. The songs are sung. The scriptures are read. It was a glorious time, and it, it is yet even today, of course, a glorious time of this triumphal entry. But as we move past the triumphal entry, we come to the broken heart. And go with me for a moment, if you will, to probably what was happening on one of the foggiest nights in history. The scene's real simple. You'll recognize it. Uh, you'll recognize what's happening. Uh, here we are in a grove of twisted olive trees, a ground that's cluttered with large rocks. It's kind of a, a dark night, if you will. And we, we see now, as we look into the picture, we see a person. And what's this person doing? He's flat on the ground, face stained with dirt and tears, hairs matted with salty sweat. And is that blood on his forehead? Now, you've seen the pictures. Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane kneeling beside a, a big rock, snow white robe, hands peacefully folded in prayer, halo over his head, spotlight from heaven, illuminating his golden brown hair. But I would say to you, the man who painted that picture, as nice as it is for us to see, didn't use the gospel of Mark and Luke. Let me read to you what, what Mark says in Mark the 14th chapter. We go there in the 32nd verse, and here's what it says. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he, now notice he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and he prayed that if possible, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything's possible. You take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but your will be done. And then we go over to Luke. In that record, we see a little more in Luke 22 and verse 42. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. But notice this now. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like the drops of blood falling to the ground. So the picture is a little bit different now. <laughs> Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, a place of test. Uh, you know, you've seen all of that. On the pictures, now we hear the gospel account. His soul is in anguish. He knows what he has to face. He knows he's got to go to the cross. He knows the torture he's going to take. He knows he has to face hell itself and die and give his life blood for you and I. It's a painful night, a horrible night, an agonizing, straining, wrestling, 
struggling Jesus, a broken heart. Then we move from there to the betrayal. Now we all know about the betrayal, what happens when betrayal comes, you know, how we respond sometimes to, maybe we try to get even or get angry or get out. But here Judas is gonna betray him, yet, yet Jesus called Judas a friend. So we see a little picture of the heart of Christ, even in the betrayal. He knew what Jesus, Judas was gonna do. In Matthew 26 and 15, out of the New Century Version, it says this, Judas talking to the leaders that wanna get a hold of Jesus. And it says this, Ju Judas says this, what will you pay me for giving Jesus to you? Jesus knew he had been been seduced by a powerful enemy. Uh, he didn't justify what, what Judas did. He, he didn't minimize the deed, nor did he release Judas from his choice that he made. But yet in all of that, uh, he called him a friend. He looked eye to eye with him, tried to understand. And now we move from that to the denial. And we all know about Peter and the denial. We all know the story. If you ever wondered, because I've wondered this about myself, I wondered this about all of us followers of Christ. Uh, what would we have done? Would we have stayed with Jesus on this terrible agonizing night or would we have been afraid as well? Would we have run? Would we have denied him? Uh, maybe, maybe we deny him in ways more subtle. Maybe when we don't follow his instruction, we're denying him. Uh, maybe his commands and we don't take his commands or are obedient or follow the commands. Maybe his teachings, could we somehow deny him and not obeying and doing what he asked us to do? And, and then we move from all of that now to I think the focus I really want to come to in this journey and that is the death of Christ. On the eve of the cross, Jesus makes his decision of what he'll do. Uh, years ago, I did some research, and time wouldn't permit, permit me to give you all of the details, but on, on the actual death and what took place and the terrible, agonizing pain, that, and my wife's crying, a lot of people crying, I, remember, I got such a lump in my throat and chest, I couldn't even talk. I, I just, you know, it was so real when you, when you see what the Lord, you know, took for us. You talk about the crucifixion, talking about now how they led him from Pilate to Calf of the high priest and back and forth. Jesus is not sleeping. He's not eating. He's not drinking. You know, they put a robe on him. They spit on him. They put a crown of thorns on his on his head. I used to have a big crown of thorns I used when I was pastoring in the church to show people. Huge, you know, and to stick that on top of his head. That alone would be just agonizing pain and the blood dripping down. You know, he's beaten. You know, he's stripped of his clothes, half naked, hands tied. And up to this point now, Jesus was in a most excellent physical condition. If you remember when he overturned the money changing tables in the temple, tradition tells us it would take at least two or three men to overturn them. So Jesus, of course, being a carpenter's son, he had worked, you know, with his dad. He was in phys excellent physical condition. But in, in less than 12 hours from that time, from that period, Jesus had suffered such physical and emotional stress. They say that, that what had taken place by the beatings and all that had happened, he was close to circulatory shock even in his own system. Savagely beaten with a whip that had varied on it in different lengths, had iron balls on it and pieces of sheep bone and sharp metal buttons, 39 beatings. And there'd be two Roman soldiers, each, each would take a turn and one would beat and, and then another would beat. And, you know, it would just go on and on and on and how that he would take all that terrible pain. And, 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 and there he is getting almost unrecognizable, if you will, at this point in time. And they said it almost, the doctor's view of it said it was almost, you could hardly recognize him. Loss of blood. And now, now he's asked to carry this heavy beam, about 125 pound heavy beam. Uh, to to carry that up to Golgotha's hill, and you know he was so weakened at that uh, that he had to have uh, 
a, a helper to carry that cross, as we know, on his journey up there. And then he comes up, of course, to the cross. And in that time, the, the scripture says that they nailed his hands and feet. Now, the Greek word for hands also included the wrist. Because if they'd have nailed it in his palms, it wouldn't have held his weight. It eventually ripped out. So really, it was it was held in the in the wrist part here, where that that it would hold his weight a lot better. And the same down with his feet. And the reason was that is that would help support support his weight. And of course, what would happen to those who are being crucified? That they would try to lift themselves up if they could, to to take the weight off of that. And of course, that would you know be even more loss of blood. Uh, a terrible agonizing pain that he would take. The nails were five, they say five to six, seven inches long, tapered spikes. Uh, and of course, at that time also, what they understood to be was they'd either break the legs below the knee to make sure they were dead or stab a spear in the side. As you and I know from the scriptures, five to six foot spear would be long enough and they reach up and jab it up under his his chest wall and the blood and the water would gush out and the question comes jesus made this decision to go through this why why and here's the answer he would rather to go to hell for you than to go to heaven without you aren't you thankful aren't you glad amen rather than to go without us you know to go through all that and the answer is Christ lived a life we could not live, and he took a punishment we could not take, and to offer us hope that we really couldn't resist. Jesus was angry enough to purge the temple. He was hungry enough to eat raw grain. He was distraught enough to weep in public, fun-loving enough to be called a drunkard, winsome enough to attract kids, weary enough to sleep in a storm-bounced boat poor enough to sleep on dirt and borrow a coin for a sermon illustration, radical enough to get kicked out of town, responsible enough to care for his mother, tempted enough to know the smell of Satan, and fearful enough to sweat blood. Why would heaven's finest son endure earth's toughest, toughest pain? And the answer is, which can be an encouragement for us for what we're going through today, or what will come our way, or even what has been in our life. So you and I would know that he's able to run to the cry of those who are being tempted, tested, and tried. The scripture says that he was point, tempted in all points, just like we were, yet without sin. He, Jesus suffered emotional stress, physical stress, betrayal, denial, terrible beating, all of that for you and I. So that no matter what we go through, as tough as it is, it isn't what he went through, but as tough as what things we go through in our life, he did it. So he would understand in the humanness of Christ, as well as the divinity, he'd understand what we think, feel, and face. I'm glad. I hope you are. I'm glad about that, that whatever I go through, he understands. He understands if you've lost a loved one. He understands if you've got disease or sickness. He understands the death of a loved one. He understands financial poverty. He understands he cried at Lazarus' grave. He understands all of that, took all of that so he could understand, empathize, sympathize with you and I, whatever we're going. time i've often said you've heard me say christmas is wonderful i love it baby jesus presents decorations i love it and it, and it had to start there but without without triumphal entry without monday thursday without i call it black friday without resurrection ah uh, we're, we're lost we're dead going to hell but jesus took all of that for us that we might have eternal life i hope we can rejoice and all appreciate that my question to you as I end the message, what journey are you on? We're all on a journey. Is it triumphant? Are you in victory? Denial? Broken heart? Are you being tempted? Uh, or a true follower of Christ? King of kings, Lord of lords. Maybe, maybe you need to make a commitment or a deeper commitment today. Maybe you're in the Gethsemane time. And we all go, you know that, we all go through Gethsemane times. 
If you haven't in the past, you will. Uh, it could be now. Testing, trying, wrestling with what's going on. And hopefully we would come to the place where Jesus did when he said, not my will, but yours be done, Lord. May God bless you today. May this message be encouragement, challenge, and enlightening. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.